If you're a dentist wondering how to treat large periapical lesions without surgery, stick around. I'll show you a simple conservative alternative. If you're new to the channel, my name is Siju Jacob. I've been a private practitioner for the past 25 years in Bangalore and Dubai. I've been using a surgical microscope in my private practice for more than 20 years, and I've been training dentists how to incorporate the surgical microscope in everyday clinical practice for more than a decade. If you've been here before and you found some value in the videos that I post every week, then don't forget to click on that subscribe button so that you get notified every time I upload a new video, which is usually every Sunday. You can also subscribe to my weekly newsletter. I've put the link in the description below so that you get even more useful information delivered right into your inbox every week. This week, let's talk about decompression, which is a very simple technique, a clinical procedure that virtually any clinician can use when dealing with periapical lesions where you don't want to do surgery. Let's take an example just to give you some context as to when we do decompression. Let's take the example where a clinician is faced with a case like this with a very large lesion and the clinician is doing retreatment. We remove the gutta percha, clean shape, and then pack some calcium hydroxide. Two weeks later, the patient comes back. And then when we go back in, we find pus again. And this keeps on repeating for two or three sessions. You never reach a stage where the pus kind of drains out and the, you get an empty canal space. Every time you go back in there, it's filled with pus. So what does one do when one is faced with a situation like that, appointment after appointment? Well, there are two options. One is one can straight away go in for surgery. But the problem in doing surgery is that then you have to do endo for all these teeth and also epistectomy. So it becomes a very, very invasive procedure, right? So when one doesn't want to do surgery and one is exploring options of even more conservative procedures as alternative to conventional surgery, then you have two techniques, which is mass supilization and decompression. Let's look at what each of these techniques are. First of all is mass supilization, where we unroof the surgical wall of a cyst by making a surgical incision, evacuating the cystic contents, and then establishing a large permanent opening by suturing part of the cystic membrane to the mucosal surface around the periphery of the lesion. So you create an open wound which heals eventually. This We don't usually do it for dental procedures where there's a periapical lesion associated with a tooth, but it's often used by surgeons for other lesions. We usually don't use it for endodontic infections. Decompression is a much more conservative procedure where a minor surgical opening is made into a cystic cavity and maintained to relieve pressure to ensure constant drainage. So you put a small drain which goes into the cystic cavity and through this drain, whatever contents are there gets drained out over a period of time. So this is decompression. It's a very, very conservative procedure. And this is how it looks clinically. You can see an incision or a small opening made through the soft tissue which communicates into the cystic cavity. We insert a drain which is sutured to the adjacent soft tissue and then one can irrigate through this opening to drain out the contents of the cystic cavity. So this is decompression. And here you see a clinical picture of irrigation done through that drain which is placed into the cystic cavity. So this is decompression. Now, before we get into specifics, before we break down very specific steps involved in decompression, let's take a look at some typical clinical cases where we use decompression to achieve healing as, or as an adjuvant to anodontic therapy. This is a first case. This patient was referred to me by another practitioner. Somebody had already done an anodontic therapy on this tooth. The patient came with a large swelling and pain. And then we advised for a cone beam CT and we found a huge lesion extending laterally involving all these four teeth and also the floor of the nasal cavity. But however, we found that when we did a vitality test of these two teeth, we found they were both vital. It was only these two teeth which were non-vital, obviously, because it's already anodontic treated. So we decided we're going to preserve these two teeth, the vitality of these two teeth, and just attempt retreatment of this tooth alone, which is what we did. We went in there, we removed the gutta percha, we went about doing orthogray treatment, put calcium hydroxide, and then recalled the patient after a couple of weeks. When the patient came back, we found pus discharge coming out of the tooth, and then 
there was continuous pus discharge flowing out again, even after multiple sessions. The patient came back after two weeks, then we changed the dressing, and then we recalled the patient after another two weeks, and then there was pus discharge. Every time we went back in there, there was pus discharge again and again. We never really reached the stage where the canal was dry enough. So what do you do when you are in a situation like that? What we did was this particular option, because remember, when you look at these two teeth, they were both vital. So if we decided to go in for an invasive surgery, then that would mean doing endo on this tooth, endo on this tooth, and then episectomy on all these teeth. So it becomes very, very invasive procedure. So we decided to do the conservative option, which is decompression. So we inserted a drain here and then sutured the drain and then irrigated that drain for a few weeks and then the entire acute phase came down and then we reached a stage where there was no longer pus when we went back into the tooth. So we were able to obturate this tooth. So you can see here, that's the post-obturation. And then we recall this patient. You can see this is a one-year recall. This is a three-year recall. And then this is a six-year recall. So it works beautifully. And this particular tooth, you can see it, it maintained its vitality. We didn't have to do endo on this tooth. This is another case. Somebody attempted endodontic therapy, referred the case. We did a few rounds of calcium hydroxide and then we got to a situation where the canal seems to be dry. So we obturated this case, but a three-month recall showed that the lesion wasn't responding. The patient came back, the patient had some discomfort and kind of a visible swelling labially. So again, we did decompression in this case. This is three months after decompression. You can see the lesions healing. This is a six-month recall and this is a two-year recall. So again, very good, but unfortunately, somebody put a joint crown. This is not our work. The patient went elsewhere. And by the time they came back for a two-year recall, somebody had put crowns. But anyway, if you look at the lesion, it's healed really well. I'm not too happy with the crowns, but this again is a decompression case. This is another case done by my friend, Dr. Sivian Rao, who's based in New Zealand. He had the same problems. There was continuous discharge from here. So again, you can see the drain inserted here. And then he did irrigation through the drain that's kept there. And then a few months down the road, he was able to achieve healing, no more pus discharge, and then he obturated this case. So another example of how decompression is used as an adjuvant to conventional endodontic therapy, thereby minimizing or avoiding the need for conventional surgery. Here's another case also from Venkid. You can see in this case, it's a mandibular incisor and a through and through lesion, very large lesion. And the same methodology, we can see the drain inserted here and then you can irrigate through this drain. The irrigation can be done by both the patient as well as the clinician. This is a post-op of the same case treated by Venkid, and you can see the lesions completely healed without the need for surgery. So those are some decompression cases. Now let's get to the protocol or each step employed in decompression. Let me break it down into very simple steps so that you can do this in your own practice. So let's look at what exactly we mean by decompression. Step one is to evaluate where we're going to put in the incision. You can even use guided surgery for this, but Otherwise, what we do is we place a small incision. Many cases like this, there is already a through and through opening because it's a pretty large cyst, right? So we place a small incision before we insert the drain. So that's the incision. By the way, these pictures are courtesy of a friend of mine, Dr. T.V. Narayan, who is an oral pathologist, who was kind enough to share these images. You can see here, you can either make an incision or in this particular case, what Dr. Narayan has done is he used something called a tissue trefine, which is this kind of device. If you don't have this, you can do this using a blade, but in his case, he's used a tissue trefine to cut a small opening here. And this is after the opening. The one thing you have to make sure is that you want to make sure that that opening communicates into the cystic cavity so that we can use this to irrigate or drain out the cystic contents. And once you know that it's communicating, the next step is the drain. So you have all kinds of drains available. Some of the examples that you see here is a Penrose drain. You can buy these and then cut it into the desired sizes. That's one way of doing it. You can even use these IV lines that you see in clinical practice. Just cut off the PVC part alone so that you can use it. Or you can even use catheters like these, medical catheters. You can cut off the desired portion here and then use it. In Narayan's case, you can see he's using a catheter here. He's cut it off. And then this can be further shortened depending on your clinical requirement. So here you see the next step is to insert this drain into the opening here and then suture that drain to the adjacent soft tissue. 
And then once that's done, you can irrigate through this opening. You can also teach the patient to do this so that they can go home and do this. And you can even bring back the patient every three, four days if you want, just to check whether or not they're irrigating it properly. Otherwise, they can do this by themselves at home. You can teach them how to do this in the clinic. This is the other material which my friend Venkat likes to use. These are like composite compules and you see these covers. You can remove this cover, then cut this portion off and then you can use the rest of the portion as a drain according to the required size, you can cut it down. So here you can see Venkat's used this here. That's a composite compule which you can suture to the adjacent tissues after sterilization of course. And then you can use an irrigation needle here to drain out whatever contents of that cystic cavity is. You can teach the patient to do this at home. So this is how it's done. One of the questions a lot of people ask at this stage is, what kind of irrigant are we going to use to irrigate the cystic cavity? Well, it doesn't really matter. You can use something very mild. The goal is not to use something very aggressive, which can go into the cystic cavity and cause some sort of an irritation uh, to the tissues or burn the tissues. So you can use something mild like saline or chlorhexidine, some solution which doesn't irritate tissues inside or cause any damage or chemical burns inside. So something mild, because remember the main purpose is to wash out all the cystic content. It's not for sterilizing the cystic content or the cystic cavity. The main purpose of using an irrigant is to flush out all the debris inside. So use something mild. The second common question is how long to leave the drain in place? Well, this depends on the clinical scenario. If you are just trying to achieve a situation where there's no pus discharge so that you can go ahead and do your obturation, then it's usually two weeks. But if it's a very large lesion and you want to see some signs of healing and you want to leave it for a longer period, then you can even leave it for, say, four weeks, six weeks, or even eight weeks. It depends on the clinical scenario and the size of the lesion and the goal that you're trying to accomplish. So that's with regards to the time that you need to leave it in place. So in a nutshell, that is decompression. Let's summarize some of the advantages and disadvantages. The first advantage is that it's a very simple procedure. This is something that any general dentist can do because you don't need any superior technical skills or some fancy instruments. All you need is a nice BP blade to make sure you put a nice opening there and you need some sort of a, a drain which can be inexpensive, as inexpensive as your composite compute cap and, and you can just suture it there and irrigate. So it's something that's very simple. You don't need any special qualifications to do that. So that's one of the biggest advantages. The second big advantage is that this ensures that you get continuous elimination of all the toxic products inside the cystic cavity. So it's not like a surgery or it's not like a one-time job where you the, the pressure or the pus tends to build afterwards. You have a prolonged period where every time some pus or some sort of a debris builds inside, you can flush it out. So there's constant exchange. So that's the second big advantage. And the third is, and I think is the most important, is that it preserves all the vital structures. So if you straight away go in for surgery, it's a very aggressive procedure where you have to curate out a lot of stuff. And it's very traumatic for the patient. And this is much more conservative. So especially in teeth where we see where there's a large cyst, uh, but when you check the vitality, a lot of the adjacent teeth are vital. And if you straight away go in for surgery, then you tend to kind of you have to do endo for all these teeth. Whereas with decompression, you find that as the size of the cyst shrinks, the adjacent teeth maintain their vitality. So this is a huge advantage when you do decompression. So those are some of the advantages, but it does have some disadvantages. What are the disadvantages? First of all, patient compliance. So some people don't like the fact that you have a drain there and it's there for a, a certain number of weeks. So people tend to protest because it starts irritating the lip if it's on the labial surface. And then for some people, it irritates the palate. So those things have to be made clear to the patient, kind of make the patient understand that it's for their own benefit. So this is one disadvantage. The second disadvantage is that sometimes the drain tend to get dislodged. If the patient is not careful, they tend to brush over it or sometimes they eat and they're very careless, then the drain gets dislodged. And once it gets dislodged, and again, it's a pain to anesthetize and then push this thing back again. So that's the second disadvantage. The third is, of course, the prolonged treatment period. As I said, you probably have to leave the drain inside for about two weeks in conservative cases. And when there's a large lesion, you probably have to leave it for even longer period. So sometimes patients tend to disappear and this duration can be a problem. And if you have a patient who's from out of town, not around for a long, and you don't have accessibility where the patients can keep coming back, then again, that's a big disadvantage with regards to decompression. But overall, when you consider all the advantages and disadvantages, the, I think the advantages are way more than the disadvantages. 
So I hope that this short video kind of made it clear as to how exactly to do decompression in your own clinic so that you can use this to be as conservative as possible the next time you get a periapical lesion, a large periapical lesion, and you want to avoid surgery on patients. If you enjoyed that content, then maybe you would enjoy my weekly newsletter, which is a short email that I send out every Wednesday. It's usually filled with some useful dental and non-dental information. I've put the link in the description below. Do have a look and subscribe to my weekly newsletter called Wisdom Wednesdays. Don't forget to click on that subscribe button so that you get notified every time I upload a new video, which is usually every Sunday. And if you enjoy content like this, then maybe you should check out some of my other videos on this channel coming up over here. I'll see you next week with another video. Till then, take care. Thanks for watching.